Hello and welcome to an all new episode of Anime Brain Freeze. We are your meddling, battling, bickering, snickering host from the nightmare dimension. I am John and I. You feeling okay over there? <laughs> sure, I'm feeling okay. Also, I'm CC and this is the show where we review all the anime series from the previous season we did and didn't watch start to finish. Uh, the winter season express is pulling into the station, but before we can focus our attention on the shows from the cold months of the year, uh, we still have to wrap up a few fall delights. Oddly enough, one of them has sunshine in the title, and that is the second core season, I don't know, of Love Life Sunshine, which John will give his two cents on. Then we go to war over nothing less but the Holy Grail in our review of, well, by now it's not the newest anime entry in the Fate franchise anymore, but it was in fall, so there you go. It's Fate Apocrypha. And last but not least, we of course have to tell you our picks for the best anime of fall 2017. Uh, but before all of that, let's quickly talk about a few shows that didn't make the cut and were dropped by the wayside in the chop and drop. Very slim pickings for the chop and drop this time. I think we both stuck with most of the shows we were interested in. I don't remember exactly how many shows you picked up, but I sort of stuck with most of what I watched. Yeah. Uh, I, I also picked up a smaller amount of shows. But yeah, why don't you tell us what which shows couldn't hold your interest for their entire runtime and why? Uh, Two Car, it was a show about... Um, this variant of racing called side sidecar tt and i thought you know hey this seems like a sort of interesting sort of thing that you know i, I don't know any other anime about sidecar racing so i thought you know hey i'll check this out all the characters felt like carbon copies of each other and i was like i, I think i got maybe six episodes in, and i was like so it's everyone telling the same story to everyone else for the whole series got it and I just kind of walked away from it after that. So, what did you end up dropping this I dropped, fall season? I dropped a few more, but uh, most of them I already talked about, actually. Uh, the first one was Kino's Journey, and, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the second one, Just Because. And I talked about why I didn't continue to watch both of those shows in their respective reviews, it's when you reviewed them. Yeah, and um, I think I made it pretty clear in the sneak peek why I wouldn't keep watching these either, so... <laughs> Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, there you go. So the uh, other two things I rocked uh, were Code Realize. Um, you know that show about which get these these kind of, this kind of classical version of Arsene Lupin sending away this girl that was trapped in her home by her father and everything, and that you know was based on an uh, Otome visual novel, Otome. I think, or or mm, a yeah. game, I think something like that. It just fell off the wagon. It was not like it was bad or anything. It's just. There were so many other shows to watch, and this, just from the setup alone, wasn't interesting t enough to me. And I was like, oh, this is probably not going anywhere that in interesting. Uh, so, yeah, I, I just, I didn't get back to it after its first episode. And the second one, I got a better reason for, maybe, uh, is Black Clover, which I stuck oh, for with two episodes. Uh, but then I couldn't tolerate the main character's voice any longer. Uh, I, I mean, I'm very forgiving when it comes to generic shonen, but not if it goes out of its way to be unpleasant to watch, or in this case, lis to listen to. I love all of the image that went around of the show, like once of Asta that said like, oh no, all I've been doing is running around and yelling. It's like, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm, exactly. And I mean, to be <laughs> fair, Naruto has, has done the same thing in his, like, you know, in the beginning before he kind of grew up and started talking like a normal person. But even then, his voice actress had a better voice <laughs> and was just, you know, constantly yelling in the same fucking tone. And uh, uh, it's so irritating. She, she had inflection. Yeah, exactly. Also talent. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, Ooh. <laughs> Ah, dishing out the, the fucking, <laughs> Listen the fucking to these shade hot, here. Yeah, come and get your hot takes, everybody. Oh yeah, the hottest takes, only the hottest takes on a show that has freeze in the title. Anyway, yeah, still. So, so this, this I just had to abandon. This was more irritating than Twin Star Exorcist. So, uh, and that's saying a lot. So, it it couldn't it couldn't deliver anything special, but it delivered a lot of irritating stuff. So, yeah, n not for me. 
But yeah, the rest we stuck with, and I, I think, and you will get reviews of all those shows soon enough. Uh, in case some of you were wondering why we didn't talk about Food Wars Season 3 yet, that one already had a second core announced when we structured the order for, uh, for the review for the season, so we decided to wait for that to air and wrap up so we got more to talk about. Uh, okay. Yeah, so that's going to happen. Uh, don't worry, but uh, we, we're going to wait for that second core to, to run its course, and uh, then we have a few more episodes and developments to talk about, and I mean, yeah, that's that just made more sense <laughs> so yeah anyway let's switch over to reviews so that john can bring some sunshine into your lives all right so it's idle time again yay in what better way is it always idle time to be honest <laughs> When isn't it? There's a new Idol Master game launching next week, so why not? Sure. <laughs> so, sorry, Rip Berserk. Uh, I mean, hey, we finally got off the boat. So <laughs> what do and, and I, I have mean, to complain about? <laughs> and I mean, it's a mobile slash browser game, so it's not, you know... A, well, then again, mobile games are time sinks. Mm. But regardless... Today is not about the Idol Master. It's about Love Live Sunshine, as you know. We've said probably about three times now. You probably could have guessed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so this is the second half of the show. We talked about it, uh, I believe, late, uh, late early last year when uh, the first season uh, aired. Uh, so we're just going to go over real brief the plot synopsis of the second season. The crux of this season has. I mean, I have to go into a bit of spoilers to talk about some of my opinions on it, but I will try and give as much warning as I can. So, uh, having decided to walk down a path separate from their inspirations as idols, the girls of Aqua are more determined than ever to shine brilliantly as school idols. With their previous performance marginally increasing the number of prospective students for their endangered school, they took to the... They look to carry the momentum of their small step forward into the school's upcoming open house and the next Love Live competition. Hoping to use these events to bring more attention to their school, the nine girls look to give their best performances yet. Unfortunately, these small steps forward are not enough to convince Marie's father from changing his plans. And undeterred, undeterred, by her daughter's plans for uh, reconsideration, the decision to close down their school is made official, putting an end to the Uranohoshi uh, Girls High School student recruitment, including the open house. Though all hope seems to be lost, the school idols refuse to give up and face with impossible odds. Aqua sings, dances, and shines in the hopes of bringing about a miracle. So mm. I want to start off. So I want to start off by saying. Uh, that the first season of this show, and I, I, I said it when I when we talked about it last, but I feel like it bears repeating. The first season really lives in the shadow of the previous series. This one does not. No, that's which, good. Uh, I, I, I assume. I mean, you were complaining about that. Some of the first oh, season yes. felt like a rehash. Yeah, and this one, it, I'm going to get into that later on, why I feel exactly like that. But this season was a lot stronger and a lot more interesting and better written and whatnot. Um, so, talk a little bit about some of the... Uh, I'm going to change the order a bit here, talk about some of the staff first. Of course, the show is animated by Sunrise. Uh, we, all, we all know what they're famous for. Gundam, Code Geass, among hundreds of other things. Uh, so this show is directed by uh, Kazuo Sakai, whose previous uh, big directorial credit was a show called Mushi Uta. And he's done a lot of like episode direction stuff on shows like Basilisk, uh, Code Geass R2, uh, Full Metal Panic, Gundam Build Fighters, yay Build Fighters, <laughs> Gundam Age, and Utakata. So, you know, got a lot of uh, good stuff under his belt. Uh, the composition and script is done by uh, Juki Hanada, who's worked on uh, 
stuff like Excel World, Beyond the Boundary, uh, A Place Further Than the Universe, which, for the record, I can't wait to talk about. <laughs> so please look forward to that. Uh, the anime adaptation of the game Robotics Notes, uh, several parts of Rose and Maiden, uh, apparently some of uh, Seven Deadly Sins. Mm-hmm. Which one? <laughs> the good or the bad <laughs> Seven Deadly Sins? The, the good one, Nanatsu ah, no Taizai. Um, speaking of other anime adaptations of Steins Gate, which I still haven't watched the anime, but I played through the game. My God, that game is so good. If you haven't played it, do it. Mm -hmm. uh, and apparently the anime is really good as well. It's one of the few game-to-anime adaptations that's re really good and really faithful to its source. Mm -hmm. And Sound Euphonium. So, you know, we're sort of hitting on all cylinders for all of these things that I personally love. <laughs> um, the uh, music, this is, there's two separate things to talk about the music. Because, the, like, the music, like, the... Interstitial stuff is done by Tatsuya Kato, who we've mentioned oh, yeah. a whole bunch of times, especially in regard to Food Wars, among many other things. But um, I was looking up, you know, some of the uh, so the actual like insert in main themes. A lot of them were uh, written by this woman Aki Hata, who's done a ton of like writing main themes for other shows like Aikatsu, Azumanga Daio. Melancholy of Haruhi Suzumiya, Lucky Star, Horizon, Saki, Super Robot Wars, The Inspector. And apparently she even had a hand in a whole bunch of video games like uh, Snatcher, Dynamite Heady, uh, Rocket Knight Adventures, which is a Damn. personal favorite of mine, uh, Contra Spirits and Soul Edge. So the body of her work is far and wide. Um, and it really, really shows, especially in the... Uh, songs in the second season the first season i don't feel like the songs were bad but there weren't as many that really stood out to me in the second season because they come the the show kind of comes out swinging with the uh new opening theme the song called our future cells and oh and it's like it is immediate and it's great and it's wonderful and there's i could probably list off about 10 or 12 songs in particular that I like across both series uh, that I really enjoyed. What what series gets the bulk, though, uh, of, of your favorite songs? I actually kind of feel like I'm leaning more towards Sunshine now. Okay. Um, one other thing uh, I sort of mentioned last time we talked about this was the dance scenes uh, about the CG. Yeah. I went back and rewatched some of the dance scenes from the original series. Uh, I want to slap myself in the face because, my God, the CG came a longer way than I realized. Huh. Like, um, the characters actually look like who they're supposed to and not generic doll faces. Ooh. And not, like, low-ass frame rate, really bad animation. Mm -hmm. How nice. <laughs> <laughs> so, I sort of feel like, yeah, I... I was probably pretty unfounded in saying a lot of what I did. Or, or, or it might have just be that they are able to blend it better this time around so it felt more organic. And I feel like that's probably the case. And I'm just full of shit as usual. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, the this season of uh, Sunshine was a lot stronger because of the fact that there was actual character development. And we got to see a lot of the characters change. You get to know each other a bit better and not just... Uh, we're going to love Bly because we can. Because, you know, the whole um, thing in the first season where they brought up Muse and then conveniently they weren't around. So the, their their hook for that seemed a bit strange and not too cohesive compared to what they are going for with this second half of the show. Let's get into the spoilerish part. Uh, if you haven't watched the show or you're interested in doing it, you should probably do it now. Uh, you know, watch all 24 episodes and then come back and listen to the rest <laughs> of this podcast. <laughs> pa pause it right here. All right, everyone who hasn't watched it is gone. Good. <laughs> so, like we were saying, the uh, crux of this uh, season is that uh, Marie's father says, you know, she's he's on 
the board of educators that uh, runs the Urnohoshi uh, High School. And since, you know, enrollment is down, the the uh, decision is handed down that, hey, we're going to close down the school and merge it with another one. And yeah, I remember. That was the setup for, for the first season. Yeah, that was also the setup for the first series as well. Okay, yeah, well... <laughs> <laughs> They, you know, appeal to them and say, hey, what if we can get more people to sign up? Okay, you have to get at least 100 prospective new students. So, you know, the, what's the best way to attract uh, attention to your school in a world where school idols are a thing? Why not go to Love Live? So <laughs> the, the girls go to Love Live. They draw enough attention to start getting prospective students and – they don't quite make it in time, but, you know, they appeal once again, just give us a little more time, a little more time. So her father petitions the rest of – Marie's father petitions the rest of the Board of Education for that. They give them a whopping 12 hours. Wow. Thanks. How generous. Thanks. Yeah, right. So it comes down to the wire, and they're close, and they don't make it. Which I was shocked by because what is an idol story? It's about it's a Cinderella story. It's about you know everything will work out in the end. Yeah, yeah. you expect thing, right? them to like come through and hey, this is this will work out. Happy feelings. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that was maybe a little over halfway through this season. And, but it, it's one of those things where I was sitting there watching, I was like, they have so much time to walk this back. And I was afraid that's what they're going to do. And they didn't. Nice. That's so, surprising. Yeah. The, um, it's a bold decision for this sort of thing, for this sort of show. I mean, the, um, and I feel like, honestly, it was stronger for it because what other way would there have been to distinguish it from the original show? You know, we have these two functionally, functionally identical shows, but at least, you know, this one has a better, like much stronger ending. It's a lot more impactful and poignant, I think, because um, it's sort of like this is the end of this chapter, you, you know? It it just feels a lot more like they took the concept of the original and wanted to mature it in this way that you know these it sorts of like things it. these sorts of things don't last forever, but you know the girls look to it you know with their heads held high, and they when um, the decision is handed down, they still go to Love Live to compete, but it's not for their initial goal. For now, they change it to be like. Let's, you know, our school might be gone, but let's let's make a name for it. Let's leave it in uh, the history books. Let's, and they do. Let's yeah. leave it in the, in the memory of the people with our songs, I guess. Right. And they do that, and it's great, and it's just really, really <clears> – it's really, really strong. It's a, lo a lot more emotional than uh, I was expecting. Yeah, cause... because it comes from a deeper place, right? And yeah, definitely. Or more sincere because it felt it feels more realistic because, you know, like you said, things don't don't always turn out like in the movies, quote unquote. So. Right, right, exactly. Um and there's, you know, these moments towards the end where you see them cleaning up everything in the classrooms and getting ready to close it down. And um there's this one really like very strong emotional part where there's this bonfire in front of the school, and it's everyone, not just uh, the nine main characters, but everyone singing the ending theme. And it's like really, really strong, man. Oh, <laughs> it's super good. Sounds like oh. it really pulled at your heartstrings there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> a lot, a lot more than I was expecting. Yeah, it's cool. It's, it feels like it's, it ends on a kind of bittersweet, melancholic note. Oh, that yeah. leaves you still a bit of uh, hopeful, but it's like, hey, you at some point you gotta gotta say goodbye to your or I don't know you necessarily your youth, but you know some some of your past uh, experiences and everything, and mm, mm, you mm. know 
Some, that comes with growing up and everything. Not everything can stay the same and uh, the way you're used to it. And I mean, that's that's strong material. Yeah, definitely. And it's, it's because of that that this show, I went from being sort of, eh, to, God damn, it was really good in the end. I'm just glad it was able to get out of its own shadow to become, to be, you know, something a bit more special than i was expecting so do you think that that was the plan from the beginning to let you know that that it would take this course or did they like i don't know course correct halfway through because people were complaining that it was too close to the original i mean i did read some reviews of the first season after you know just to see if other people felt the same and i mean yes a lot of people were like yeah it feels like a retread so maybe Maybe that was the swerve that they were going for. I don't know. I'm not. Mm-hmm. I can't say what went through uh, the heads of the people in the writing room. I but, wonder. Yeah. Maybe there are some interviews that shed, shed light on that. But yeah, I, I don't know either. <laughs> Obviously. Yeah. Maybe I'll try digging a little deeper on that. But I was. I had a hard time turning stuff up. So. Mm. Might as well mention a list of the songs that I really like, because why the hell not? Sure. With that kind of, you know, with a show with that kind of subject matter, it's fitting. Yeah, because, I mean, like I said, the first season, there was a few songs. There was uh, Sky Blue, Jumping Heart, We've Decided Hand in Hand. I'm going with translated names so I don't sound like a complete weeb, by the way. <laughs> uh, feelings become one, and rather than our, rather than talk about our dreams, let's sing them. That's a great name, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, and in the second season, there was, like I said, the uh, new opening theme, "Our Future Selves Know." Uh, My dance tonight, Miracle Wave, which has probably the best dance scene in the second season, because the you know. We see glimpses of the girls throughout both uh, seasons, you know, training up and doing the the choreography for their dances and there's this one where chica wants to do like this triple like backflip thing and she's having this hard time doing it and it's really difficult and then when you know it comes to for the time to actually do it on stage she nails it and everyone else is amazed it's a really good scene (laughs) um Science. There was a Awaken the Power, uh, Water Blue New World, Wonderful Stories, and another great name. Where can you find courage in your heart? Mm-hmm. So, how many how many songs are there? You know, in each given season. Oh, there is a lot, but not one new song each each episode, right? No, uh, probably like every couple or every three episodes. But you know, they also have the. Uh, albums with extra songs on them they had the preview videos for each for between each and during each season you know for like hey get hype for the new show coming up sort of thing so they would you know make their own pv with a new song and a new dance to hype mm-hmm. it up it's because you know hey did you forget it's an idol anime i guess the note <laughs> we can leave the sign is that Yes, the first half of this show is weak in comparison. But if you have the patience to get through that, this second season definitely rewards that patience very, very much. The Fate franchise has a long and storied history at this point. Um, I've only been an occasional visitor so far, so I have to rely on John for fact-checking since he's the genuine Fate adept, I guess. Well, as much as I can be. I mean, to be... I'm, I'm exposed myself here. I still have not played the original game, and I would like to at some point, but I, I know fan patches and whatnot exist, but still kind of holding out hope that maybe someday there will be an official English release. But Yeah, if, speaking of that, if I'm not mistaken, everything started with uh, an adult game turned visual novel, a novel which you were just talking about, I believe, mm-hmm. uh, called Fate Stay Night which was written by uh, one Kinokok Nasu, developed by Type Moon Studios. And it's 
basically about the seven incarnations of heroic spirits from our history called servants, summoned by seven magicians called masters into our current time uh, to fight for their masters in a giant battle royale. And the price is nothing else but the Holy Grail. And in this case, it will not necessarily prolong your life, but that can also happen. But it will grant you a wish. It will grant a wish to each member of the winning team, to be specific. So that's the basic setup for, for kind of most of the Fate series things. Though, you know, there are changes here and there and we'll get to that. But yeah, since then we had a plethora of follow-up games, novels, manga, anime, light novels, everything. Several spin-offs, which you have watched some of. I think you've watched all of the Prisma Ilya series, for example. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so there we go. We have alternate timeline, universe tales. Fate is fucking gigantic. And uh, at this point, it's really hard to grasp how it's all connected and what to even recommend as the perfect entry point for newcomers. But yeah, uh, the first thing I got into contact with in the franchise was um, watching the first anime adaption by Studio Dean. I don't know if that was your first experience too. I think so. I'm going to tell you right now that it, I don't own a whole lot of DVDs, but I actually have that series on DVD <laughs> right over here. Uh, a questionable honor because that series was of questionable quality. <sighs> yeah, yeah, it really was. <laughs> Not only in the animation department, but mostly. Yeah, also weird wrap up. But yeah, that, that's I, I watched that I, back then noticed already its shortcomings but i i don't know it was enticing the setup alone was enticing there were very interesting many interesting characters in that show uh you know the original saber and uh uh archer and yeah those you know archer's famous quote i'm the bone of my sword that you know just has to stick with you all in all of its english glory and uh, it did <laughs> and yeah, so so I was like, hey, that's that's interesting. And um, I've checked out a few other series from the type Moonverse uh, since then, like Tsukihime and Garden of Sinners. Uh, Wait, hold on. What 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 show did you say in there? <laughs> I I think you talked about something that doesn't actually exist. All right. I, I liked Tsukihime back when I watched it. I think I'm the only one. <laughs> I certainly liked. <laughs> I remembered liking it more than Garden of Sinners, but it's been a, it's been a very long time. Maybe if I rewatched it these days, I would hate it. I don't know. Uh, I mean, but... Garden of Sinners is something I've been meaning to get to because um, I sort of bounced off of Fate Grand Order because the grind in that game is insane, even amongst other mobile games. But when in the international version, they had the Garden of Sinners event, uh, they were like, hey, all the movies are on Crunchyroll now. Isn't that a coincidence? So I, I would like to actually go and watch those now that, you know, you can in an easy legal way. Yeah, I don't know. It, it felt even, it felt very convoluted. And there's a lot of exposition dumps with a lot of techno babble that I didn't appreciate in that show. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it, it felt at times like it was trying to be convoluted for you know, being convoluted, just, you know, for the sake, uh, sake of that. Uh, and, yeah, um, the rest, I don't know. That show just felt, felt kind of fragmented to me, and I liked some parts of it, but definitely not all of them. And uh, a lot of people said it, was, it they liked how it came together at the end and the way it wrapped up, and that just... I didn't have that experience. It's just it didn't it didn't resonate with me in that way. And by the end, I was kind of underwhelmed. And I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I I didn't like that series that much. But yeah, the next Fate thing I consumed was Fate Zero, mm. uh, the anime adaptation of a prequel manga to Fate Stay Night, written by one of my favorite anime writers, Ken Robuchi. Yeah, he wrote Psychopaths and um, Madoka Magica. Mm. Mm. Two uh, series I I very much very much enjoyed. I think are fantastic. He also wrote uh, um, a Kamen Rider series, probably best Kamen Rider series out there at this point, at least story wise. Uh, also, it has a very dumb gimmick that was Kamen Rider Gaim. Enjoyed that too. And he wrote the, the Thunderbolt uh, fantasy series. I couldn't get into that because 
puppets, mm, not my thing. But yeah, um, Fate Zero was fantastic. I love Fate Zero. Uh, the visuals, the characters, the story, everything about that series were great. Pretty much from beginning to end, I was totally hooked. I think uh, you also uh, got a lot of love for that series. It's probably my favorite of the Fate series so far. And that's I think that's the one that sort of cemented his cemented UFO table as the Fate studio, or the main Fate studio, I should say. Yeah, and rightfully so. Uh, I mean, that that series just looked fantastic. The fights, the, the effect worked, every, everything <laughs> just amazing in that show. And uh, yeah, it ended on a really strong note too, and uh, not not on a happy note. Jesus no. Christ, definitely not. But on a poignant one, and uh, yeah, good stuff, really good stuff. Um, definitely, Fate Series is definitely my favorite. Uh, to, not to take away from you know the show we're going to talk about today, but Fate Series is definitely uh, my favorite entry in the franchise so far, uh, without a doubt, and miles ahead of all the other entries. Uh, but after that came the new anime adaption of Fate Stay Night, uh, adapting a different route. First, uh, Studio Dean, uh, you know, the, the visual novel had three routes, I believe. Fate, yeah. uh, Unlimited Blade Works, and... And Heaven's Feel. Right. Heaven's Feel has been adapted, adapted recently as a movie. I haven't seen that yet. Or I think <sighs> the first part, I think it's it's going to be two parts or something. I'm, I think it's supposed to be three parts. Or that, right. So yeah, that that's still happening. But yeah, the second anime series adaption was adapting the uh, un, uh, Unlimited Blade Works route, which was more concentrating on the story of uh, Archer and, and Rin, I think, while the Fate route, original one, was more concentrating on Shiro and, and Saber. Hey, don't forget the Blade Works movie by Dean. Mm, yeah, that, that that was also a thing that happened. I actually have not, I've forgotten everything about it. <laughs> I have not watched that one. I just when uh, I was planning to and then I was like, oh, UFO table is going to be doing a Blade Works series on it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, the animation in this new adaption was certainly a bazillion times better than in the Studio Dean version. Um, the story was kind of mixed back for me. It started pretty strong, in my opinion. Um but in the end, it just couldn't follow up on the great setup constructed by Fate Zero, in, I think. And um, yeah, at first I thought, hey, this feels different enough from the first adaption because, you know, like they went for a different route, you know, more other character focus and everything. And, you know, some of the story paths changed up and what happens to some of the characters. And like I said, the build up was pretty good. Uh, but the second part of that show was where it went downhill for me pretty fast. And... I don't know, the, the finale was not, I don't know, didn't feel that strong t to me, and I don't know. It's just, I don't know, how did you feel about that second adaption? I think you you liked it, right? Yeah, I, I mean, I enjoyed it for what it was. I mean, I get why... From beginning why to you, end. Yeah. All right. I mean, uh, I get why you might have a few misgivings about it, but I don't know, I feel like as a whole it was still pretty enjoyable. One of my biggest misgivings is that Shinji survived. <laughs> well, isn't that always a misgiving when he survives? Because it does it doesn't matter what timeline, it doesn't matter what universe, it doesn't matter what series or spin-off or subgenre, Shinji Mato is always a dick. Yep. Well, here's hoping that he uh, dies a horrible death in um Fate Extra. In Fate Extra. I mean, I haven't watched past the first episode, so I don't know if that already has maybe happened. I hope so. Anyway, <laughs> I'm going to catch up on that soon and then we'll see. Um, don't spoil me. Anyway, I so won't. yeah, but that's that's pretty much, you know, all the stuff that happens, happened fate uh, animation wide, uh, wise for face. Like I said, there were the spin-offs with uh, Prisma Ilya, which took some characters um, from, from Fate Stay Night and made, turned it into a magical girl anime pretty much. Mm -hmm. uh, but I haven't checked that one out. So, but but you like you watch it, right? You, it's pretty entertaining. It's it's goofier, but it's fun. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's actually one of the few series that Silverlink will actually you know do good work on. Yeah, right. So 
you know, lots of different en uh, entries in the franchise with varying quality. So I went into this newest entry with a somewhat hopeful but also wary attitude, especially since at this point the concept was starting to lose its freshness. So yeah, how do you make this Magician Heroic Spirits Battle Royale interesting again if it has already happened on screen several times? Well, it's actually kind of easy. You throw a bunch of the established rules overboard and get fucking crazy, uh, which is what Fate Apocrypha did. <laughs> By the way, there will probably be some spoilers in this review. Um, I'll try to give you all a heads up when that happens, but be advised, just in case um, you don't want to know anything. But yeah, um, Fate Apocrypha, which is based on a light novel series, is about two clans of magicians duking it out pretty much, each with their different reasons for engaging in the fight for the Holy Grail War. We got the Red Faction, led by Shiro Kotomine, and the Black Faction, led by Darning Presson Igdemilinia. That's that a name. fucking name for the books. <laughs> That that name, every time I hear, I'm like, shut up. Yeah, it's a you weird mixture of Yggdrasil and Melinia, but why couldn't they just stick with one of those? So I don't why know. Could, why couldn't you have chosen a name that actually rolls off the tongue? Because it's yeah. Yggdrasil. Fuck it. We call it the Iggy <laughs> Clan. <laughs> that works. So, the Iggy Clan. <laughs> anyway, uh... Now, here's already is is where Apocrypha already sets itself apart from the Fate series that came before it, at least anime-wise. Um, so each side in Apocrypha summons seven servants. So we have fourteen as a whole, two of each class. So naturally, there's a there's lots more fighting to be had and a vastly extended cast. Uh, and also, this is an alternate timeline, and the events of Fate Zero and Fate the Night did not occur in this world. As such, just from you know the setup alone, the ki this kind of makes it a good entry point because you don't have uh, need to have pre-existing knowledge for from what came before it. You know, if you wanted to get into like say watch the f make the first thing watch be uh, the new Fate the Night adaptation, which you know takes some of the stuff that happens in Fate Zero and you know expects you to have watched that uh that doesn't make it as, as easy i still consider fate zero to be the best entry point just because it's the best fucking series in the franchise mm -hmm. but you know just from the setup alone fate apocryph is not the worst point to start at just because it says okay that shit didn't happen we are starting over the holy grail war is an existing thing in this universe and it has happened before but all the other stuff that we've already done in the series you know that didn't happen because it's in the timeline and everything so yeah um we also got a new class called ruler which hasn't been used in the anime adaptions of fates of the fate series so far i think mm. and yeah none other than john dark is incarnated in that class um just taking over the body of a girl instead of being incarnated from, from her, I don't know, spirit form. Um, she's supposed to be a neutral judge, but since some players in this uh, game, in this game of chess, kind of don't play by the rules, she has to pick a side, multiple sides actually, uh, once, once things get wacky. Um, she's also kind of supposed to be the main character, along with a homunculus called Seek, who is initially uh, brought to life as a tool for the Black Faction, uh, but who has a much bigger role to play in the uh, in the fight than in the battle than just being a simple cannon fodder, as it turns out. Uh, so yeah, uh, John, why don't you tell us about some of the other characters? Well, I mean, one of the things that they sort of issue in this series is that in all the other previous Fate series, one of the big cruxes is discovering who your opponent is and you know that can obviously be discovered by uh what their fighting style is you know what their weapon is and their tactics and you know oh you could derive from that your x or y class uh mm -hmm. and they sort of just said nah hey screw that uh we're just gonna start throwing our true names around because why not <laughs> no fox given right yeah just sort of right out the door which sort of I guess helps expedite the process, but also removes a little bit of the uh, mystery. Yeah, it's a different approach. Uh, just, you know, the the tone of the show in general is kind of pretty different from what came before it. 
It feels more like an like an like an action block bu- blockbuster than the other shows did. Right. Uh, yeah. It, I guess you could say that. Mm-hmm. I mean, what 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 better place to start on a uh, fate series than talking about the servants? Because why not? Yeah. So integral uh, part. Yes. So on the uh, Yigdmalinia. On the black side. <laughs> Fuck that name, dude. The Iggy side. Yes. I'm just, you can call it Iggy. I'm going to keep calling it black side. Because <laughs> sure. why not? Yeah, on the black faction side. So on the black faction, we have uh, the Saber Siegfried. I've uh, got the Archer Chiron. Chiron? Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the, does it, the spelling of the name doesn't seem to agree with the way they were pronouncing it in the show, so... Yeah, well... <laughs> yeah, it, that, that's Japanese for you. Yep. Sorry, everyone in Japan. That's, that's a li- it happens. That's a, that's a little bit of a blanket statement. That's that's not right of me to say. The mm-hmm. uh, Lancer of Black is Vlad the Third, and who we all know and love is Count Dracula. Yes. Uh, the rider is Astolfo, caster is Solomon, uh, Berserker is Frank and Steen, uh-huh. and the assassin is Jack. One of my favorites. Jack the Ripper. Not Jack the Ripper, but Frank instead. Nobody likes yes. Jack the Ripper. <laughs> yeah. I think. I assume. I don't know. Maybe she has her fans, but I didn't like her. Uh, I'm sure she has her fans. But yes, Jack the Ripper is a girl, by the way. But, you yeah. know, uh, gender gender bending is not a new concept to the face. No, it's not at there all. since the beginning. The focus of the first two series, I would say, like, the, the biggest servant is King Arthur, basically. But it's a girl. Uh Saber is, you know, the Saber class in the in Fate Zero and Fate Zenite is inhabited by by uh, Arthur or Artoria. Uh, Artoria is her name, I think, in this uh, in this show. And I yeah, think it's just yeah. I think the uh, translation is starting to slowly shift towards Altria, which I'm not a fan of, but you mm-hmm. know, yeah, I am. I like Atorio too more. But yeah, it's it's weird because uh, gender is a very loose concept in that show or it feels like it because those characters, uh, um, you know, definitely looked like girls, dressed like girls, but they categorize themselves as he and king and not queen and everything because, you know, may, that that's what it is. Um, mm. <laughs> and Astolfo is, is, is a boy in in this show and when you see him the first time you don't assume that <laughs> but that's how it is <laughs> he's also great he's one of the best characters in this show definitely yeah but what are, what are some of the other uh, uh servants in the show uh on the red side we have uh mordred as saber mm-hmm. uh archer is atalanta uh lancer is karna uh, the rider is Achilles, so you know we are. There are actually some familiar names in here. Some of these heroes, you know, I had to look up to be honest because I wasn't mm-hmm. super familiar with them. Yeah, uh, 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 Castor is William Shakespeare. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, weird choice, but in yeah. the end, it kind of makes sense, especially when you consider how the story is good. But basically. You know, yeah. each each servant in the fate franchise, uh, fate franchise has like a special magical skill. Sometimes that relates to their weapons. Sometimes that relates to I don't know some some magic trick they can perform. And I don't know Shakespeare. I think has without t- taking too much away, he can spin the story in a certain way. And uh, yeah, I, I really guess that, that would I guess that would be fitting of a caster role. So yeah. But I, I mean, Fate Grand Order has also proven that uh, servant classes are not hard and fast. Apparently, uh, anyway, ber- the Red Side Berserker is Spartacus, mm-hmm. and the Assassin of Red is Semiramis. Yeah, lots of colorful characters, and uh, as usual with the Fate franchise, if you know anything about the historic figures or you know the figures from fairy tales and folklore that they use. Uh, you will get much more out of the show because, you know, just 
it's just fun to look at these weird anime, wacky anime interpretations of these historical figures or, you know, fairy tale figures. It's like, ah, okay, that's what they did with that. That's interesting. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I always appreciated it about the Fate franchise. You know, in the in the first two series, like more to find out, oh, which who's that character and you know you know, make this more of a of a mystery. And in this one, like, oh hey, here's this wacky version of Frankenstein, this girl with a giant electric hammer. And uh yeah <laughs> you know it's just it's just wacky it's fun it's cool uh some neat designs there and uh yeah you just, you know um we spoke of saber class and um our author being you know the one in the previous series being the focus and this time we got Mordred which is of course Arthur's son from the legend and um also a girl again but very much different character um much more forward you know saber before arthur saber was much more reserved and cold and Mm -hmm. you know uh i don't know good manners and modern is just a fun uh booze loving (laughs) adventure loving scamp uh very loud very aggressive um i don't know fights with cats Uh, but yeah she she gets uh or he gets a great partner um in uh, in Shishigo, who mm. is a necromancer, becomes pretty much uh, Mordred's um, Mordred's master, or not pretty much becomes Mordred's master, summons him. And I first packed them to be the main characters of the show, and they should have been. <laughs> yeah, it, it, you get that initial uh, feeling, don't you? Yeah, they feel like they feel like titular characters they you know the first series the first episode is pretty much about them and how uh how uh, Mordred is summoned by Sisigo and everything and how he uh you know enlists in into the ranks of the uh, red faction and everything and it obviously is like okay this is a setup for their journey and um the series might have profited from them actually being the main characters because to be honest they are the most interesting ones not just because they're the most fun, because they are pretty much, uh, Astolfo aside, uh, but uh, you know their dynamic is great. The way they talk to each other, the way they you know immediately understand each other and can do like these amazing tech battles and work together is just a blast to watch. And it's, every time those two were on screen, I had the best uh, were on screen. I had the best time. And uh, I think my only misgivings <laughs> misgiving there would be that they are not you know, the, the the main character of the story. Um, because this story is more about Zeke and more about Jan. But they are not as interesting characters. They are more straightforward. I maybe would call them a bit generic uh, and not not just not as interesting. They're not bad characters per se. But uh, I think, you know, just, you know, t- talking about that now... <laughs> uh, taking this away because we were joking about going to war over this, which we are obviously not going to do because we are well-mannered uh, people. <laughs> but, are we? Uh, we? We'll see. But, uh, <laughs> John, you did not like this show. No. I... I... I don't know why I didn't drop this show, to be honest. Because I, I thought it was honestly really really uninteresting and boring okay i get that you know they're trying to do something different with it and and i appreciate that but so much of this just for me anyway just fell so flat i would say i I can see where you're coming from because you know for example there are a few slow points in the show and like i said i think it would profit it if it had more interesting main characters uh, and the focus would have been more on, uh, you know, on Mordred and on Shishigo. But just for me, aside from, you know, the f- few slow moments in the show, there is barely, in my opinion, un- any unnecessary downtime. Uh, when things are in danger, were in danger to get stale for me, uh, for example, at the halfway point, all the rules get thrown overboard, servants become masters, the cards get reshuffled, new allegiances are forged... Uh, I, I really like the brisk pace of the show this time around. I, it felt like okay, we're gonna we're gonna structure this like a big brawl uh, action blockbuster thing where there's pre- almost a big hallmark battle in every second episode, and 
if if I can say anything about this show that maybe you will agree on, that a lot of the battles look really fantastic in this show. Uh, Not all of them, okay. I I get that you have had some mis uh, misgiving, especially of the about the later ones, but uh, yeah, I, I, think I, I don't some battles that that even you appreciated. Yeah, there are some that were pretty good, like. Without going into spoilers, there's one towards the end with a giant time stop. Mm. I think I can say that's safe enough to say without giving away what the crux of it is. But mm. a lot of the rest of it, A1 needs to put in more effort. I honestly feel – because this – Obviously, they've been making the bulk of their money off of sword art. And, you know, when they get thrown these other side projects, it, it feels like they just sort of don't care. And, and it was, and, and I've said that when we talked about um, Lyoko Nano, how vivid, like they just slept walked through that. And it, there was no point where that show looked good. And I, I don't feel like that's the case with Fate Apocrypha, but. There's a lot of points where it was like, oh, what, what were you doing? You know, I had some points where in the in the dialogue scenes and everything where stuff looked janky and you had like off models and everything, and which I expected because it's a one, <laughs> like we already established. <laughs> but aside from that, especially in the action department, I felt like this is the the best show uh, optics wise they have delivered in a while. Let's say since Erased, maybe. And I really, I really, I know it's, it looks very loose at times. It feels like, hey, you got more blobs of colors than everything. But yeah, in, especially in those kind of kinetic battles, I can really, I can tolerate, I can, <laughs> I can accept this kind of, you know, this kind of loose pencil work and everything. If it, you know, if it feels like there's some, some motion there, feels like, like I said, if it feels really kinet kinetic and well directed, and that's the, that's how it felt to me. I thought the action direction was really strong. Like it always felt big. It always felt like there was there was there was a lot of great camera work, and I love great dynamic character work. And I thought there was a lot of that a lot of that in that show, and that the battles pretty much always got me invested and interested and uh, even if it was between lesser characters because a lot of a lot of those battles a lot of those battles in my opinion look really good albeit not you know super super sharp at times <laughs> yeah there were some parts where during some of the action seasons where it's like oh you know this this looks good this looks why does this look like a sketchboard <laughs> why and that immediately was like nope mm mm yeah, and I, I I don't know. At times, I I really enjoyed this this sketchboard scenes. As long as it's not all the action scenes, but sometimes like okay, there's so much going on here that it feels like like <laughs> like I don't know. This scene is coming alive, and it's it's there's so much thing happening that everything like blends into uh, uh, blends together. But I can still kind of make out what's happening, and I don't know. That feels just like. Together with the fucking sound editing, and that was also really strong in this show. Like the explosions when stuff gets destroyed, when you know the servants uh, use their special weapons, their noble phantasms, and shit explodes everywhere. I my my fucking surround system really, really got got a lot of stuff to do with this show. <laughs> like like it uh, it yeah. I I got some real enjoyment out of uh, out of the sound uh, work too. Uh yeah, uh, good stuff. I just you know I can see I can see why you might have uh, might not like some you know the look in some parts of the show, but I I really think that's some of A one's strongest work compared to other A one stuff I've seen. Eighty percent of Magi does you know <laughs> look like the worst parts of fucking uh of fucking Apocrypha. And, uh, you know, only, you know, one or let's say one to three episodes look uh, as amazing as some of those battle scenes, if at all. Mm. So, and I really enjoy that show. So A1 is, you know, uh, like you said, the best stuff that they have produced is sort out online, look-wise. And, uh, yeah, or pr pretty much the best stuff I've seen so far anyway. 
I mean, Outlaw Zero looked good too. If there's one thing you can good thing you can say about that show, and like we mentioned, Erased looked pretty good for the most part. Yeah, though. yeah, Erased too. Really solid work there as well. Um, but yeah, I think action wise, this this show is a standout, especially in terms of direction. Like I, I really, 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 especially enjoyed the camera work. Yeah, the the other thing that uh, I can see where people might have trouble with is that a lot of the side characters. Uh, some servants and masters too uh, are getting the shaft in terms of character development because there are just so goddamn many. Uh, <laughs> I, for example, would have liked to see more from Frankenstein. Mm. I thought she. I mean, I liked her story, the the bit that we saw of it, and you know the relation to her original mythos that everyone knows from the movies and everything. Uh, but you know, I would have liked her to be a more prominent character than she was. Because, you know, I thought she was really cool and fun and, and interesting. Yeah, but I yeah. That, I thought the dynamic between her and Collis was really good. And I yeah. wish they had done more. Yeah, that's, that's, you know, again, that's probably the one thing that I would complain about the sh uh, in the show is that they decided to make, give some of the characters that, you know, are maybe the least interesting, <laughs> the most prominent roles. Like Sieg and Jean. Yeah, that that's that's a problem. I mean, I like I like how Seek and John's story wrapped up, and I think you didn't like that either. If I, I remember correctly, you hated the ending pretty oh much. Oh my god, I thought the ending was the stupidest shit I've ever seen in any Fate series. Okay, tell me why. I mean, spoilers, people. Of course, when we talk about the ending now, but you know, yeah. I want to hear John's thought on uh, thoughts on this. Oh, the, the the third magic is threatening to destroy the world. Guess I'll turn into a dragon and carry it to the other side of the world. What? <laughs> yeah, here's the thing, though. And here comes into play, if you know more about the, um, you know, the, the origin of those characters and their stories, then sometimes you can get a bit more out of this. And Zeke turning into a dragon made total sense for me, actually. <laughs> because... You know his his story, his his original story from the um, the Ring of the of the Nibelungs uh, saga. You know, in in context of that, all of that kind of makes sense somewhat, because uh, Fafnir, the dragon that Siegfried slays in that story, stole like this ultimate treasure in that tale, uh, which in this universe, of course, would be the Holy Grail. Mm. And you know, if he is the character who slayed that dragon and got this dragon power in that weird fantasy setting. And if Shakespeare wrote that fucking story, then, uh, yeah, of course he would turn into the fucking dragon who steals the treasure and takes it somewhere that where it's safe and where, it can, where it can't be uh, abused. And, yeah, like I said, as always, it helps if you know some of the historic background and folklore, um, which in this case... I kind of did only loosely. I'm not super familiar with that with that story, but a bit. Uh, learned about it a bit in school and everything. But yeah, knew enough about this to make it feel like uh, it wasn't coming out of nowhere for me. And it also made for a nice happy ending, which is not necessarily a staple of the Fate franchise, I think. <laughs> oh, I'll just turn back from being a dragon into a human and live happily ever after with the Maiden of Orleans. Okay. I like that. I really like. I, I like that those two got a happy ending. I I needed that. I loved that. And you know, hey, Shakespeare was also happy about it. <laughs> what, hap what happens when you put together two stale pieces of white bread? You get a nothing sandwich. <laughs> yeah, that, I guess that's fair. But you know, just in terms of the overarching plot, at it's like yeah, these characters are not super interesting. I but at least I can understand their motives. And they're not unsympathetic or anything. So I was glad that they got a happy ending. The one I would have liked most is if the story was about Shishu and Mordred. But then yes. again, yeah, then again, that story would never, <laughs> probably wouldn't have had a happy ending. Not at all. Yeah. Every, you mean every everyone dies and, but, and stuff like that. But just the same, the buddy yeah. cop, they basically had a buddy cop dynamic. Like you said when the show started off. Oh, yeah. And that was great. That was awesome. And then it was like, where are they? Where yeah. are Mordred and Shishi go? <sighs> yeah, that, you know, a misplaced focus. Uh, I wonder, you know, th this is based on a life novel, so there are not different route, uh, routes there. But, you know, 
uh, maybe we get a different interpretation one day where uh, they, those two are the focus. I really hope that it can happen. I mean, I know there were some changes made from the original LN. Like, um, oh yeah, people people were wondering about that, right? Or, or complaining because I, I tried to do some research on it and I couldn't turn up a whole lot. But the one thing I know for sure is that um, Siegfried and Jean are supposed to meet up way later than they do in the show. So okay, yeah, I wonder was that a, it that would have been a better choice to bring them together earlier if they had more interesting development with each other you know give them more time to make that you know make that happen and give let their relationship grow the problem is that they don't develop them over their initial yeah well <laughs> motives mm -hmm. i would say I mean, okay, John obviously develops feeling for him and, you know, that makes uh, feelings for him and doesn't want uh, want him to get involved in the war and everything again. She feels for him and, uh, you know, vice versa, that happens later. And so there is some development. It's just, it's not... It's not it's great, not man. going. It's not going anywhere new or super interesting. And that's that's the main problem of this show. And, you know, I've repeated it several times now, but it's like, yeah, there's so much cool stuff around this, but, you know, the, the main core, the focus of the story, like the, the main two characters, their story is not that interesting. I liked how it wrapped up, you know, other, <laughs> maybe I'm the only one, but everything that comes before it with those two is just, eh, shrug, okay. Yeah, those are two nice kids, they're... They're, they're all right. Can we go back to Shishigo and Mordred again? Because they're really fun. <laughs> you know who I actually thought was kind of interesting? Uh, an interesting factoid about uh, this is that this is this character's second Fate uh, series appearance. And as the uh, second uh, appearance as their servant type uh, to boot was Dracula. Oh, yeah? When did he appear before? In Fate Extra. He was also a Lancer there. Oh, so wait, is he going to be in the Fate Extra anime now? I'm a couple episodes behind on that, so I don't know if they've gotten to that part yet. If they're going with the story, I think they're going to, but maybe. I'm not sure. Um, I sort of feel like it was interesting the way he was went, you know, was saying to Darnick, hey, don't use my noble phantasm. Because, you know, Vlad the Third. You know his rep his reputation precedes him for being you know a very bloodthirsty monstrous sort of guy Dr Count Dracula, and you know I, I sort of felt like it was interesting that you know he didn't want his noble phantasm to be used because that would expose that ugly side of him that he sort of wanted to keep hidden away, and I thought that was neat, and I feel like you know. Maybe they could have done a little bit more, but, you know, then Darnick decides to be a dick and, you know. Yeah, but very effective in the way that it it's the like it's the second series in the same year that made me feel sorry for Dr Dracula. The other being the Castlevania mm. uh, anime <laughs> that also has uh, Dracula as a tragic figure, which he was pretty much this, uh, in here as well. Like you said, he fights for the the black faction and you, you know we're, we're talking like there is a clear we haven't we haven't made that clear there isn't a clear definition who's who are the good guys and who are the bad guys in this war at the beginning it seems like the black faction are the bad guys but you know that's that's not clear cut and stuff gets even more muddled later on there are some people that you initially pack as you know that kind of character, mm. and they might surprise you. There's one specific character I was really so, who I pecked, I like this perfect total a a incompetent asshole, and who really like turned around by the end. And that I, I think I, I know I who also you're talking about. Yeah, I also really appreciated that. I was like, oh, I didn't see that coming. I didn't see the character turning out this way. Great stuff, Fate Apocrypha. Thanks. Caught me off guard. But yeah, also Dracula. You know, tragic figure because, you know, like you said, he doesn't want to use his noble phantasm. What uh, else could it be like than vampire powers, right? Hmm. And uh, he doesn't. He doesn't want. He never wanted that power apparently, and he never wanted to use that, and he hates it. And yeah, for Darnik to to use that, and that it's just such a shitty move. <laughs> it's yeah, just, it's just it's it's such a 
such a mean, sad th scene. I really, I mean, like I said, I feel, felt really sorry for Dracula in that moment. And uh, especially, he was not being an asshole uh, in, the, in the series. You would expect to be him like he's the general of, kind of the general of the black, uh, or, or the highest ranked servant uh, on the black side. But uh, he he doesn't feel like he's a super arrogant asshole or anything. He just feels like a, well, like a noble spirit or something. Yeah, he's just there to help lead the other servants and you know that i th again that's interesting you know that you know these two shows this in castlevania made him out this way because he always think of dracula and i you know i want to suck your blood sort of creature yeah. but <laughs> you know it's interesting to see the writing in these in other shows you know sort of put that in the head a little bit yeah. not, not in a way that oh dracula did nothing wrong obviously but you know yeah, it's like, okay, we got, again, sad, shame that the focus is too much on the characters that are not that interesting. They also wasted like two or three episodes on fucking Jack the Ripper, who nobody gives a shit about. <sighs> Eric's like, okay, really? <laughs> yeah, that's a sad character with a sad story. It's just also kind of annoying. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, you still got a lot of interesting side characters with a lot of interesting stories. You got uh, Achilles uh, and his sister, who has, like, this dynamic with, with Chiron, who is this teacher, who was his teacher. And, you know, you got, you got different interesting character relations. It's, it's just a shame that some of the characters don't stick uh, around long enough to do something more interesting with that. You know, just because they have to move the plot along and have to get rid of some of the characters. What I like, though, is that even when the ser some of the servants are killed, their masters still stick around, which didn't really happen in the in the previous Fate series. I think, if I remember correctly, once a servant was killed there, the, most of the masters, you know, lost... I mean, they didn't completely ex exit from the series or anything, but they didn't, you know, play really a part in the main story anymore. They maybe got an epilogue or something... But they weren't, you know, that important to the story anymore. And I feel like in this series, at least some of the masters still have an integral part in where the story is going, you know, mm. and uh, mounting, you know, certain attacks and putting some plans into motion. And I appreciated that. It feels like, okay, these characters are not just in here to fight, but they're also, you know, with their servants, but they're also in here for other stuff. And, you know, that gives those characters a bit more development. And I just, I just liked how this series handled some of its side characters, even though, like I said, some of them not, weren't long around uh, enough around for my taste, especially Frankenstein, mm. <laughs> best girl. Uh, no, probably, <laughs> probably murdered. I don't know. Hard to decide in this show. Yeah, I mean the overarching plot and the the obvious main characters are a bit, but. I, I I do wish, you know, there were more more focus on the side characters from, you know, more than there was. Like even like, I, I don't even know how you would begin to do that differently or better. Because I mean, I don't feel like an OVA or something would lend itself well to this sort of thing. Because no, you know, we we know how everyone's uh, fate <laughs> turned out anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. I mean, you know, some characters get nice wrap-up and epilogue here uh, in the show, and uh, of course not all of them, because, you know, mm. <laughs> barely any of them survive. <laughs> That's the way the fa that fate goes. I don't know, maybe maybe the light novels are uh, have enough di in, uh, different stuff in them to make them worthwhile checking out, or, the I mean, there's a manga adaption too that's still running, I think. So yeah, maybe there's enough different stuff in there to give the story a new spin that makes it work a bit better, at least regarding its main plot. And, you know, maybe shift the focus. From... <laughs> I, I mean, it's hard to to completely shift the focus to a different set of characters if the story is kind of built around another set of characters. Mm. I mean, you would have to completely, you know, change some of the layouts of the battles and story developments to, you know, to shift the focus to uh, our favorite pair, uh, to Shishigo and uh, Mordred. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. Um, 
I would just appreciate a fucking spin-off series, like 13 episode road trip series with <laughs> with those two. I watch the shit out of that, man. Like <laughs> that would be amazing. <laughs> just uh, during the course of the series, it's like a uh, wild fat apocrypha happened. Uh, like <laughs> there was this this one month span where nothing happened in the main plot, but Shishigo had <laughs> and fucking Mordred went around and uh, on a great adventure and traveled through I don't know Europe, whatever. Uh, make 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 this a fun thing, like like a Lupin esque series. I don't know mm. something like that with those two main char- with those two characters as the as the mains. I would really appreciate that. I mean, apparently, I really like this apparently the original uh, writer Higashide did write a kind of sort of side story about Jack the Ripper but yeah. It, 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 yeah yeah but uh and this is something I just learned while I was looking it up uh, apparently the story ties into a canceled MMO okay so maybe they could have used that to expound more details but you know all the could have should have would have and we'll never know at this point yeah but uh, final word, I would say on Apocrypha, if you approach this series as a big action thing with a lot of kick-ass battles, a cool, uh, albeit a bit repetitive soundtrack, I not really talked about that yet. I like the music in that show, but, you know, you pretty much always get the same main theme kicking in when the battles start. <laughs> mm. But, you know, aside from that, it was still a cool soundtrack. Uh, but also, you know, also some nice character moments. I think if you if you go into the series with with expecting this, I, I think it's not a bad Fate series to be your first one. It's not as clever or thoughtful as Fate Zero, not by a mile. And I don't think it's trying to be. Like I said, it feels more like, hey, this is just supposed to be a fun, uh, wacky, uh, colorful action ride. Uh, and, you know, don't think think about it too hard. While, you know, Fate Zero had a lot to say and a lot of interesting stuff. I don't know so much about Fate Stay Night. I'm very... <laughs> I know, I'm very torn on NASA's writing and... Uh, Understandably you know. so. Yeah. So, uh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe that had some interesting stuff to say as well, but I've forgotten about it. But yeah, Fate Zero definitely, Fate Zero definitely went a lot deeper with its themes and, uh, you know, exploration of the whole setup and and stuff and the characters which were much more interesting and well written uh but like i said i think the, don't think faith apocrypha is trying to be that it's just trying to be a fun action rom for the, its most part and um yeah i don't know if you want to get into the fate franchise you can start with this one depending on what you want if you want uh kind of more meaningful, maybe a bit slower series that nonetheless has some cool action scenes uh, and, you know, a really good plot, really good, well-written characters. Check out Fate Zero. If you're just in it for the fucking effects firework, I would say check out this one, check out Fate Apocrypha. Uh, Both, in my opinion, are fun series. I know John sees it differently. (laughs) He Mm. probably would never recommend Fate Apocrypha to anyone. Uh, I mean, I guess if you don't know anything about Fate... (laughs) Yeah, maybe. Yeah, okay, that too. I mean, if you're a Die Hard Fate fan, you've probably seen it anyway. Uh, and maybe if you expect, you know, more the more traditional setup and stuff from Fate, uh, then uh, this is not for you. Um, but yeah, if you want simple blockbuster action with a lot of cool fantasy interpretations of historic characters, maybe give this one a go. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um I think John, you would probably recommend Fate Zero like over mm-hmm. o- over everything, over this one, or or over everything, Fa- other Fate, over this one, and and probably over the uh, Dean series as well. To be honest, would you rank uh, Fate Stay Night Unlimited Blade Works the new series on the same level as Fate Zero or Fate Zero, or I would probably put it maybe half to one step down from feet zero okay all right so if you can take anything from that definitely watch fate zero <laughs> <laughs> and if you want a more light fluffy kind of dumb uh but sometimes in my opinion very enjoyable action rom you can also check out fate apocrypha i mean it's it's sure it's not the shortest show uh but uh i think it's 
yeah, it's it's got a pretty brisk pace, uh, even though the story had, has not that much interesting to say. But you know, it I didn't I was never really bored when I watched the show. So uh, I don't know. We, you you can check out like you know the first few episodes and decide whether you will end up on more on, on John's side of things or more on my side of things. The and, right uh, side or the wrong side. Mm-hmm. It's just. <laughs> <laughs> get the fuck out of here oh okay and... <laughs> fine <laughs> no it's all it's all good you know opinions man it's all go- cool and good so yeah uh that is i think our two cents on uh on fate apocrypha but we're not quite done yet because it's time for best of the season so yeah, uh, best of the season. I think for you it was a bit easier for m- than for me this time. I John, was, why don't you tell us what what uh, won best of the season for you? I was actually able to narrow it down to two shows this time around instead of what was it, like five last time. Oh yeah, last season was brutal. Um, yeah, I kind of threw this idea back in my back and forth in my head a lot, but I feel like. My favorite show for this season was probably Recovery of an MMO Junkie, even with the baggage that it initially brought along. Because, you know, like like uh, we said the last time I mentioned it in a single breath, now you can enjoy it guilt-free. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> but but um, it, it was so well-written. Um, it was so well-written for what it was. Um, the studio use their budget so smartly and it was just oh, i just really loved everything about it. it was a fun relatable story with interesting characters and i just i couldn't recommend it enough to someone who's looking for a rom-com aimed towards an older audience sure sounded like it and uh I might still go and check it out. I don't know. Uh, I mean, I'm not into rom-coms, but it sounded like this was at least more in the direction that I'm interested uh, in than uh, the usual high school rom-com stuff. And it's also a slightly uh, shorter series coming in at 10 episodes. So Yeah, so yeah, not a long watch. Uh, yeah, speaking of which, uh, my pick for best season, well... Let's talk about the shows that you know were actually contenders. I mean, there were quite a few. Uh, so one of the contenders was uh, Blood Blockade Battlefront and Beyond, mm. which was fun for me, but I ultimately liked the first season more than the second one. So I didn't feel like this would be up on the pedestal. I don't know how you was that one of the what was that your other contender, John? Uh, you know, I had thought about that, but. I think I don't know if I agree that the first season was better than the second season. If one was better than the other, really, because I I did enjoy both of them. They were very different. Yeah, different feeling. Yeah, I enjoyed both of them for different reasons. But um, my other contender, because I needed something to elicit a very powerful emotional response out of myself, was Love Live Sunshine. Hey, there you go. <laughs> so, because um, uh, I, I'm not. I guess I shouldn't be afraid to admit that I cried like a little bitch during several moments in the show. So that's all right. That's good. I'm always glad when a show manages to call out big emotions from people. So I'm glad that uh, Love Life Sunshine managed to do that. So yeah, all right. Uh, well, yeah, but Blood Pocket Battlefront, like I said, enjoyed the first season more. The the next contender, of course, like you just heard, I really enjoyed Fight Apocrypha. That would also have might have been a choice. Mm-hmm. But more of a light, fun action rom. Couldn't stand, couldn't stand up to the other two things that... Uh, that I had picked out. So it had to be decided between Land of the Lusters and Girls Last Tour. Before this recording, I still wasn't really sure which one I would have pick. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm gonna decide right now. I think I'm gonna go with the same reasoning I used when going with Recreators over Made in Abyss, which is I think both series deserve to be at the top, but Land of the Lusters will probably get a second season, so it has another chance to win. And I think what I like most about the show was the potential of where it might still go if this you know if this show would stand on its own 
it would you know it would not be enough for me like but I can see where it goes and what it might do, and that that is more even more interesting to me than what the show already did with you know with the episodes it aired. Mm-hmm. So for now, yeah, I'll pick Girls' Last Tour for Best of the Season, a great great self-contained slice of life story that has some interesting things to say with two super sympathetic main characters, uh, a lot of heart and sorrow and hope. Uh, I told you in the previous episode why I love that show, so I won't repeat it here. But it's not a long series, just like Recovery of an MMO Junkie. Go watch it; it's great stuff. That's all I can say about it for now. If you want, if we want to hear more <laughs> and why I picked it, go back to the previous episode, to episode forty-seven, and check out my review of uh, review of Girls Last Tour. Anyway, that's it for fall season two thousand seventeen. Uh, we'll see you in a few weeks with our sneak peek for spring and our first review for winter. Until then, stay frosty, sunny. Mm. I don't know. Yeah, don't don't let the snow get you down. It's 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 three days into spring, man, as of this recording. <laughs> Just do whatever floats your boat <laughs> and stay fresh, I guess. We'll see you guys in a few weeks. And that is a wrap on the 48th episode of Anime Brain Freeze. All the music in our show is from the Double Dragon Neon soundtrack by the amazing Jack Kaufman. Please go to vit.bandcamp.com and check out his awesome work. Our show is available on most of the popular podcast services, but it's always worth visiting animebrainfreeze.com for some interesting articles linked in our episode release posts. Follow us on Twitter at AnimeBrainFreeze, we tweet regular updates and fun anime-related stuff there, leave us comments and questions on Facebook and our YouTube channel, or send an email to AnimeBrainFreeze at gmail.com. We would love to read your feedback. Thanks for tuning in, we hope you had a good time, and please join us again on our next show. That's good. Take care, everybody. Next time... On Anime Brain Freeze. We travel into a rich fantasy world to watch a beauty discover her own worth and the love for a beast that must learn to become human. Yeah.